this uh, portion of the of the yogic practice now that we have worked up our subject from psychology observation of current schools of psychology to the preliminary condition in which the individual decides to follow a line of self development or development of consciousness as apart from education from outside or intellectual information and we worked up that a certain preliminary was necessary before one could take up real practice of yoga a preliminary in the sense of formation of an attitude that yoga is not like a practice that you say i have acquired knowledge of mathematics or economics or history geography that is not the way in which this knowledge or this development can be attempted it must become uh, a, a material condition a, you gather the materials before you begin to practice yoga because it will influence the whole well psychology of the individual and for that the willing consent and understanding to some extent is necessary understanding may be of intellectual type or it may be a feeling of a call you see if one is intellectual he wants to understand why and what he wants to do if he is not he feels called upon because the present formula of life does not well, satisfy him desires or ambition or ego or work or attainment of property or something that doesn't seem to 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 meet the inmost need of the individual and somehow he feels that he must do something so that he can exclude from his consciousness or change his consciousness in such a way that the outer impacts would not have the disturbing effects on him and would not all the time weigh upon him with a galling sense of imperfection that one is imperfect that something happens and he is at the mercy of circumstances or conditions or people or persons or property and so on it looks to him a derogatory condition uh, so far as his mastery of self is concerned he always feels that he should he should be the master of himself and uh, the extent to which one does not feel that well uh, he feels the necessity of an inner culture which will be the first priority of life which will not be a side activity just uh, you know added to the other activities of life and pursued at leisure and uh, it didn't matter whether it came to anything or not that is not the way in which real yoga is attempted i know in china in japan in part lots of parts of america the attempt is that yeah, you do yoga why not you have a bank account and a, you know what you call a check book in your pocket put god in your pocket also and can go about no it is is a good acquisition after all there's nothing wrong we have property we have money we have car well we have addition can add, add a god and he would be very useful because we can tell him cure our you know illness when we are ill or get us out of difficulty would be quite a useful addition it's not the spirit in which it could ever be attempted it's all right good to make some attempt instead of doing nothing but i mean uh, real yoga requires this preliminary attitude of the individual voluntary attitude arrived at either by intellectual understanding or experience of life or by an inner call it is then that you get the first preliminary condition satisfied that it is the first priority of life and it will involve a complete change of consciousness it's a development not of mind or heart or emotion or will or anything it is change of consciousness from an ego centric being into a being that is centered in the true self which is one with the cosmos with the universe so that the self of the individual will cease to be an egoistic being but will become large to include the universe or cosmos within its you know consciousness and not only that it can go beyond and rise to a divine consciousness which is supra cosmic if you like to call it beyond the cosmos which is the cause of the universe and support of all individuality it can go to the extent of developing an identification a unity or union with that ultimate supreme transcendent consciousness this is the aim and understanding now for that we saw that the foundation has to be laid because this realization or this process is not to be pursued as an individual achievement it is not to be a special 
birth right of somebody who has done some special work and now he is uh, singled out from others as an extraordinary individual who is superior to everybody else. It is not to be achieved as a personal achievement or gain. It is to be done for the sake of bringing the light of the divine in one's life. It is to fulfill oneself in the divine will. That uh, uh, carrying out of the divine will is the highest possible fulfillment of man on earth. And therefore, you, one who attempts the yoga takes up the attitude of developing this consciousness in order that that will come in life. Now what comes in life is distorted rays of the divine consciousness through the ego, getting a perversity all throughout by you know, subject into impulses and desires and ambitions and all that. It is operating like that through a medium which is distorting and which is really speaking, well, uh, making the, the, the wrong effect, so to say. The, the absence of the divine is all the, all the time felt because of this distorting medium through which all that is higher passes through the human ignorance. Well, when that is removed, the light consciousness and harmony, and the peace and uh, the, the power of the divine and the purity all would be able to manifest itself in life by that process of identification of the individual with the Supreme. The purpose is to bring the light of the divine in life and fulfill one's existence in the divine by carrying out the will of the Supreme in oneself. That is the highest possible attainment man can claim and that is the highest service he can render to humanity. It is always thought that unless you go out something by your in your mind and ideas and schemes and ethics and uh, you know philanthropy and altruism and so on, you are not doing anything to the world or good to the world. And this in some people have actually said also, argued wrongly that uh, to pursue your own spiritual development is a kind of selfishness. This is the attitude which some people have taken without understanding what they are talking about because if that is the case, then to learn and go to school before the whole world goes to school also is a kind of selfishness. You see, to eat before everybody in the world has eaten also is a kind of selfishness, isn't it? You don't wait until everybody has eaten. Yeah. If the need in the humanity has a reason, humanity will come to it. You need not go out to save humanity or serve humanity before, first of all, knowing the right way of serving humanity. Vivekan said pertinently in one of his speeches that, you see, humanity is like a falling house. And you repair it at one place, you find that it is falling down at some other place. <laughs> Something somewhere else, it's crumbling. So you go there and you put your hand there, well, it is crumbling somewhere else. Because you don't know what is the remedy. All this effort is good in the sense that it breaks the, the, the crust of the ego in the human individual if he does it seriously and sincerely. Very few people do altruistic and philanthropic work sincerely. It is very often to satisfy idea of one's superiority or self-complacence, to feel one is very pure and very good and very, very high and superior to everybody else whom he is obliging or doing charity and so on. It is very egoistic movement in nine cases out of ten. And very sincere, it gives you some lift in inner consciousness to prepare you for the inner life. What change is required is not to try to change humanity before oneself is changed. Because what is really required for serving humanity is not well known to people. They don't understand. The best way of serving humanity is, first of all, to remove from oneself the pressure of the ego, the drive of desire. It helps everybody else to conquer desire and to conquer his ego. You do not know. It looks very selfish from uh, when you look at it that he is only doing it for himself. But ego is common to the whole humanity. So is desire. And anybody who is controlling himself or getting himself freed from the bondage or pressure of these forces of ignorance or forces of present condition of man's, you know, uh, ignorant condition, well, he is certainly helping others to attain the same. I'll give an illustration. If you took the last world war which took place, World War Number 2, 
then sometimes the front extended up to 1200 miles i remember once when russian front was there 1500 miles the front of the allies and the axis extended to about 1200 700 1500 miles now at times only one sector made an advance one mile half a mile two furlongs four furlongs and the lawn montgomery you know section made an advance or general uh, you know petitions uh, you know uh, army made an advance but nobody said that oh they are very selfish they are see advancing you see we are all standing and they are advancing away you never thought it was selfish no you said our whole front is advancing is it not is it this is from history i'm telling you yeah. well there is a fight between ignorance and knowledge between light and darkness between well uh, the light of the divine and ignorance of man and then anybody who makes an advance there is the advance of the front of the whole front that is making an attempt to conquer darkness it is a general part of the general plan in fact he is fighting the battle for all one who is fighting his desire and controlling it or reducing the pressure of his ego and getting rid of it he is helping everybody else who is doing the same thing only you don't know the medium in which it is operating but that is the medium you don't know how atom fissioning is operating so <laughs> knowledge for knowledge you must know that that is that is happening because this is a common element elements of ignorance are common well then we laid down that the problem was not only to have developed the consciousness for one's own sake but to open it to a higher light so that the higher light may come and penetrate life and a noble life well therefore we accept life in the yoga and then what is necessary is to change the foundation of present constitution of man if the light is to become permanent light if the light of the divine is not an occasional miracle or extraordinary condition in which you rise now and then but you want to make it a normal part of man's consciousness just as at present his mind is normal his intellect is normal his emotional being is normal in the same way the higher consciousness if that is to become normal available to man for his future evolutionary purpose of ascent to higher consciousness then the present constitution and foundation of man's nature must be changed that's what we are talking yesterday I am bringing this subject because that is relevant. Well, then the foundations now of human nature based upon ego, necessity of desire, separation of himself as one individual, and all the actions and reactions of the vital, nervous, intellectual and emotional nature which are based upon egoistic personality, all that must go. Then the new foundation can be laid down. And the new foundation will begin with attempt of this individual to aspire to the higher truths call down the higher truth because the, the reality which you believe in is not a static condition so far away from the world that it has to traverse a good interstellar space before it reaches here even man is now outstripping speed and reducing time and space to almost a vanishing points you see now, well to a consciousness of which we conceive as the divine Omnipresence is a spontaneous power connected with any concept of the divine and any religion. Omnipotence, omniscience and omnipresence. So that you are not to say it has to come from somewhere. In fact, it is. And it is dynamic because it is omnipotent. It is not lacking in knowledge because it is omniscient. Well, then in that case, the only thing that one has to do is to open open the, the veil which is dividing that consciousness which is present from one's present self, that's all. The opening is prepared by or given by aspiration, by constantly wanting the higher light, wanting the truth, wanting the supreme. And you carry that aspiration throughout the period of life, not only when you sit down for meditation or worship. It is not only when you are concentrated only for the time being, that is only to practice, to habituate yourself to or oneself to the, to the concentration on the aspiration. Once the habit is established, the, the aspiration is to be carried out throughout life, 24 hours if possible. No one has to go on aspiring whenever one is conscious of himself. He must say that I exist and I live because I want to read the truth. Life is given to me almost as a gift. I didn't want it, I didn't know it. It has come to me, isn't it? Nobody wanted. 
to be born, and he is there. So, <laughs> well, you say that it is a gift, and of this gift, I want to make the maximum use by knowing the will that has brought me into life, so that I want to fulfill the will that gave me my life. Oh, well, all the time you aspire to it, and then a connection is established. A rejection of all that is contrary to this aspiration also is second part of the work. You reject whatever contradicts this aspiration. When you contradict for the truth, something of the untruth will come. When you contradict for the light, something of you know, darkness will come. When you, con when you want to con you know, concentrate on or aspire for the higher consciousness, something of the lower consciousness will rise in your being. This is law of nature. That whenever an upward pull is exerted, the gravitational downward pull becomes more active. Because the forces with which the sadhak has to deal are not unconscious. They are conscious. The people have not yet known anything about that science. So they think that something happens. It is not accidentally that something happens. Forces of vital desires and ambition and impulses that come to men are conscious forces. And they immediately know that somebody, X, Y, or Z, is trying to get out of their clutch. Absolutely. And it is then that the battle begins. It is so long as you are indifferent to their existence and their you know, movement, you don't care what happens to, uh, to you or to them. But immediately you make a will or decision that now this play will stop. Well, you will find that you are in for trouble. Because naturally they all concentrate on, 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 on the fight. And it is in the, in the strength of the divine, in your sincerity, that one wins. One wins because one is not single. One is not alone left to fight the battle. One is expected to be single to begin with. But as soon as he is sincere, he gets the full support of the divine in the fight. You see? So that uh, you, are, you have to fight out the battle against the forces of ignorance with the strength of the supreme light and power. Well, rejection is a second part of the of the effort which the individual has to make, aspiration, rejection. And third is surrender to this higher force to which the aspiration wants to open us. Uh, it, just as you, you know that you have a very intimate friend, then what do you do if you have a difficulty or if you are, if you are in, in some uh, state in which you have to consult somebody? You always think of him. You think, I must ask him. And you know that he is there. Well, it, the availability of divine to man is, is more than that, because the, the intimacy of the human with the divine is far, far greater than intimacy that can happen between human beings. Because it is spontaneous. You see, it is, it is as it were, it is automatic, there and then. It is immediate. It is, there is no, no intervention of any outside agency between the two. You see, <laughs> so, so it is immediate. Well. One surrender to this constant presence in the heart or in the world, in the cosmos, everywhere, but uh, one knows himself far better by self-experience. Uh, the, the, the first knowledge one begins with is knowledge of himself. All people who claim that they are going to find out knowledge, the first knowledge they begin with is intuition of themselves. They don't know how to prove your own existence. You cannot prove it intellectually. If somebody says, prove that you exist, you will find it very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Very difficult. <laughs> you know it by an act of intuition that I am, and you finish that, then you start with that, you see. <laughs> to prove that you exist is very difficult. It's really logically one of the problems, you know, in philosophy. It's very difficult to prove your existence. You start with it and say, well, I don't mind whether you believe or not I am. And you <laughs> That's how you begin. Well, this same existence of the Supreme and relation of the individual to the Supreme, is axiomatic and the surrender makes possible the action of the higher power or the Supreme Force into oneself. It is uh, enlarging oneself, so to say. When you say surrender or self-consecration, it is not as if you are eliminating your personality. That is what I was telling the other time. It's not re reduction of personality to, to non-existence or to zero or to get away uh, from our self, so to say, if I am surrendered, what remains of myself? As if oneself was some precious possession. Himself, oneself is full of ego, and there's nothing, nothing very much to be proud of. But people always think, whenever I've seen, people are told that you, you must surrender to the Divine or the Supreme, they say, oh then, what happens to me? 
<laughs> you see, now this me is not a big possession. First of all, it's full of littleness and smallness. And what it has to grow up is its smallness, rather than anything else. And the result of giving up smallness is an enlargement. It's a gain and not a loss at all. <laughs> well, uh, this self-consecration's greatest advantage is that it makes possible the action of the higher power on human nature and establishes those foundations of which we spoke yesterday. The foundations are calm, detachment, faith, sincerity, a capacity to remain equal under all conditions. Some of the foundations we were studying yesterday, is it not? That is not really speaking something acquired by man, but qualities of the higher nature. It is power of the divine that is coming. It is the first contact of the higher consciousness which establishes peace in the human individual. Calm and peace, detachment, equanimity under all conditions. Well, some elements with which the higher consciousness begins to act and establish a foundation. We were talking about some of the foundation. Now we come to some foundation that we were dealing yesterday. I forgot what. Yes, so that is the greatest thing you could have forgotten. <laughs> there are some persons who think that consciousness is energy. So one disciple asks here, Rindu, whether what we call consciousness is energy. Now, general idea of energy is inconscient force. Well, it's consciousness is not an inconscient force anyhow. Otherwise, it won't be consciousness. The fact that we call it consciousness shows that it is conscious and not unconscious. So, when the disciple asked him whether consciousness was the same as energy, he replied, and that reply is very, very clear and nice reply. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd taken the cure. <laughs> That is called, uh, you know, Newton forgot and made two thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot my kerchief. Well, consciousness and energy. If consciousness and energy are the same thing, there will be no use in having two different words for them. In that case, instead of saying, I am conscious of my defect, you say, I am conscious of my defects. One can say, I am energetic of, energi energetic of my def defect, which wouldn't be right. <laughs> you know, we are putting things so, so clearly, <laughs> demonstrably. I am energetic of my defects. If a man is running fast, you can say of him, oh, he is running with great energy. When he is running very fast. But do you think it would be, it would mean the same thing if you said he is running with great consciousness? <laughs> He's showing the difference only between the two. Consciousness is that which is aware of things. Awareness, cognizance of things um, that happen to come in contact with it. Energy is a force put in action which does things. Doing and being aware. You see, there is a difference between the consciousness and energy. Consciousness is that which is aware of things. Energy is a force that, force that is put in action which does things. Consciousness may have energy and keep it in or put it out. Consciousness may have energy which it may hold back or it may put out. But that does not mean that it is another word for energy. And that it has to go out when energy goes out. When energy goes out, the consciousness may not go out. And that it can't stand back and observe the energy in action. Consciousness can stand back and observe the energy carrying out an action or an operation. Then he asked also whether consciousness is something that is always independent of mind, always independent of life. When you say consciousness, does it mean that something different from mind, something different from life or vitality? 
he answered that it is not so. Consciousness is not by its nature detached from the mental and other activities. By its nature it is not. There is a mental consciousness also. There is a vital consciousness also. So that by its nature it is not detached from mental and other activities. It can be detached. Because consciousness is not confined to mind. Consciousness is not limited to life or body. Body, life and mind are functions or parts of nature or instruments in which consciousness act, can act and acts. But consciousness by itself is independent of these instruments or the mediums through which it can, act, can and does express itself. It can be detached, it can be involved, it can be identified. In the human consciousness it is as a rule always involved. Consciousness is involved in mind, involved in life, involved in body. So there, therefore there is no independent consciousness for a man unless he has trained himself. If you ask a man, you see, where is his consciousness, he will say, I am body. That is my consciousness. Because he, has, he is very conscious and largely conscious of his physical consciousness. Very few will feel that it is life. And so he will feel himself as a living being rather than as a physical body. And still fewer will feel themselves as mental beings or mental consciousness. They, they hardly feel, they feel life and body is mainly felt by nine people out of ten. The existence of mind as an entity and a mental consciousness independent or, you know, capable of separating itself from life and mind or body is known to very few people unless they have training or unless by nature they have realized the, the separation from the mental consciousness from physical consciousness. But it is, it is quite easy for one who has just a little observation or training uh, to see the distinction and see the separation clearly that consciousness is there in the body and another consciousness is there in the mind. The same consciousness taking up mind becomes mental, the same consciousness taking up the body becomes physical consciousness. They can operate sim separately, they can interact, you see, they can act and react upon each other, that is true because consciousness is one that is operating all through. But uh, this separation is not easily known to people and some independent consciousness that has that is not bound to manifest itself in mind is known to very few people. That consciousness can exist without body apparatus or without life or without mind. And that is what the world is. It is a consciousness. That is what we saw in Life Divine, chapter 5th, 6th, 7th and 8th. We say operation of a conscious power. The consciousness which is power is operating. That is the whole cosmos is a manifestation of that. The universe is conscious. And mind begins with the idea that it is not conscious. The whole trouble is that. Because mind is pinning itself on the immediate appearance of an object. It doesn't see that it is a vastness of which you are separating this one object artificially, really speaking. It is a part of tremendous whole. A mind not being capable of taking the whole begins with one object and this is an object, where is consciousness? But the whole would not be there if there was no consciousness. How can self-operating laws operate for ages and ages and ages and irresistibly carry out processes without a guiding consciousness? How can a thing, an inert thing go on acting according to a law? An inner thing will be creating a chaos or a pell-mell world of chance. A haphazard world, you see. It would be, a, as he put it in life, even a, a chaos, a world in which there would be no possibility of discovering any workable law. On the contrary, you find the rule of law. The very fact that human mind is able to understand the operation of matter is a sign that there is something that connects this mental consciousness with matter. If matter was absolutely disparate, completely separate in its constitution from mind, mind would never have understood matter. Two disparate things cannot come in contact even with each other. If they cannot come meet each other, the fact of meeting shows that the medium which connects, you see, well, the <laughs> 
consciousness can be involved. In the human conscience, it is as a rule always involved, but it has developed the power of detachment and detaching itself. I think with the lower creation, in the animal creation, seems unable to do. As the consciousness develops, this power also detachment, power of detachment also develops. In the mind, there is a power of detachment. That's how mind acquires more knowledge than the animal kingdom, you see. Mind can always detach and observe the phenomena as if, you see, it had nothing to do with itself. Temperature and pressure and, you know, rise of this or that. Well, to it, much of the discoveries of science are due. To it, also, much of the progress of philosophy is due. A detached observation of life, of man, of seeking for purpose and so on, first with a detachment. The more it is attached, uh, the less is the, the realm of knowledge available to man. There is a belief in some quarters that unless you renounce, you cannot read the truth. In fact, that is the thing we already finished in our first talks, even when before I went out to Los Angeles, that unless and until there is renunciation, one cannot attain the reality or the truth. If you want to think seriously of God, then you must give up life. And if you want to live life or live in life, then you must forget uh, God or at least not think seriously about God because the two cannot go together. No, this is a, a dangerous half-truth which has been uh, put into circulation because certain people thought that uh, the problem was only individual attainment, one. And problem was only reaching the reality, two. An individual attainment and reaching the reality. Both are partially true only. The attainment is not individual because it's a birthright of all people to attain the divine. Divine is nobody's monopoly. So all human beings are by birthright uh, capable of, and uh, because they have a divine spark in them, each one, all human beings are capable of realizing the divine. So it is not an individual attainment, one. And secondly, the problem is to reach only the reality. You are artificially dividing this world from the reality. And saying that if you want to reach the reality, you must turn your back on life and world. Turn your back here, then you are... Well, if this is the expression or manifestation of the reality, then it is partial attainment to, to turn your face only to the reality. And say that we are concerned with the reality, not with the world. Therefore, the problem has to be thought of in a global, in an all-inclusive manner. I mean that... Uh, if all are to attain, what would be the nature of the attainment? Not if I am to attain, that's wrong. Oh, for me it is good not to do work, so let me arrange, uh, attain a truth or a reality in which there will be no necessity of work. That will be natural condition. But if, if one understands that it is for all, then you have to admit a reality which can operate in all, which can fulfill all. That's, that's exactly what is required. But in that case, your approach will be to see how, not only to reach the reality, but how to bring it down first into yourself as a preliminary condition to its coming down in others. Therefore, renunciation in Shirondu's scheme of yoga does not find uh, indispensable place. If any renunciation is needed, it's an inner renouncement or renunciation or abandonment of Egoism and desire, which are to be abundant in the inner being and not necessarily to be carried out uh, externally because that would be almost uh, reducing the field of operation of the higher consciousness. So one fellow asked about renunciation and he replied, those who flee from the world and shun action do so because they would be involved, they would be bound. They feel that they would be bound and involved. They believe the world to be unreal. But in fact, it weighs on them <laughs> as a reality, so long as they are in it. That's why there, if they believe it doesn't exist, it, they wouldn't want to go away from it, isn't it? See, that's called clear mind. Not a comprehensive mind, but clear mind. The mind which has got a light of you know, knowledge in it, not thinking. 
This you can't arrive by thought, this by sight. You see like that and you at once. There is a language which is called seeing thought. This thought is not th thought out thought, but seeing thought. You see, it makes you see immediately. You don't require yourself to think. You don't argue afterwards, you see. As soon as he says, you understand. Oh, yes, it is right. Well, he doesn't want to make you go through any abstract logical process. It makes you immediately to see. That's the power of mind, which is called pasyanti. It is called sight, you see. Power of sight in mind which not only sees itself, but makes others see. <laughs> well, that is, you see here, for instance, they say, they would be involved in bound. First, it gives their logic, which is so nice, and so you think it is right now, they say. They are free from the world and sun action, they do so because if they remain in the world, they would be involved in bound. They believe the world to be unreal. That is their proposition, which he admits. But in fact, it weighs on them as a reality, so look, that's why they run from it. <laughs> <laughs> when one is perfectly free from illusion of reality of things, then they can weigh, they cannot weigh on one or bind at all. When you know that they are illusory, then you don't give them importance. Then you don't want to run from them because they have no binding force. What can they do? Desire or ego, that they all rampant all over the world. But as soon as you know that there is no real existence in, in your scheme of things. Well, it can exist all over the world. It doesn't affect you at all. You are not bound. <laughs> Outer renunciation then becomes, well, at least uh, not indispensable. Somebody complained that he was tired. And I think that that's here also some of them might require the recipe for a cure and a yogic recipe at that. <laughs> you can always try that, and I think it is very successful because it's not only in one case, but in many cases he has tried. To be quiet without means outside, and to be quiet within is what is needed when there is this sense of fatigue. So when you are tired, Try to be quiet outside and quiet inside. There is always strength near you, which you can call in and will remove these things, but you must learn to be quiet in order to receive it. So this is very simple remedy in one sense, isn't it? Doesn't require to go to the doctor. <laughs> At least so far as the fatigue is concerned, and you go on taking nervous pills for what? Is all all kinds of things they take nowadays. What is this? They have got some, you know, current remedies, huh? Tranquilizers. Hmm? Tranquilizers, yes. <laughs> and even <laughs> so-called eminent people who claim intellectuality actually carry out experiments on this childish thing. <laughs> what is it? Huxley and others, isn't it? Huh? Yes, yes, yes. Trying to create psychological condition by resorting to outer, most material remedies, I mean physical remedies. It's the most childish thing to attempt because it's no use, even if that is true, that by drinking, you know that people when they drunk get into another condition. What's use of doing something else? You know it every day. It doesn't require so much scientific, as if you are one of the most eminent people in the world, to tell us that if you take some drugs, you get out of your senses. I mean, this was known to human beings 5,000 years back. 5,000 years back, people knew that if you drink, you get out of your common <laughs> consciousness and get into some other condition in which you think you are in heaven. <laughs> yes, exactly. You see, you, you get a spontaneous, really speaking, it's the Sachin and the delight which he's getting without being ready for it, and he thinks he is in delight, which is really true. But uh, but he doesn't know that <laughs> it is his self-forgetfulness which uh, throws him into that delight unconsciously, and when he comes back, there is a terrible reaction. <laughs> his headache and his uh, foot ache and all kinds of problems. <laughs> for this, you need not have advanced 150 years in science uh, to say, <laughs>
It looks to be so, so puerile an experiment to prove psychological thing by saying that if you take drug, and there is a subtle, you know, hint that that is what samadhi is. They really do not know what they are talking, I tell you. They really do not know. And the unfortunate part is, it doesn't matter if they don't know. Many large sections of people think they are very intelligent people. Oh, they are intellectuals. Are they are not even infants in the realm of spiritual life. They are not seen the gates. And they, they sit in judgment over these things. They sit in judgment over, oh, Patanjali is yoga, that's only a uh, little bit of yoga there, otherwise we know what is yoga. They actually sit in judgment. Well, any, any, any infant can sit in judgment on any wise man, there is no doubt. <laughs> that's all right. We don't dispute the right. We don't dispute the right of sitting on judgment, we dispute the propriety of it and the correctness of the judgment. Certainly we do doubt. I mean, is this a man who can sit in judgment of Ramakrishna? I ask you. I mean, it takes my breath away to put the two together. He is not even 100 miles near him. <laughs> where is Ramakrishna and where are these happening fellows who are talking about drugs and, and trying to approach Samadhi to drugs? A man who is, you see, unlettered, not capable of signing his name, enters into that consciousness and comes out a wise man who can give answer to all your abstruse questions. That is Samadhi. A contact of a concrete consciousness, not lapse into unconsciousness or subconsciousness, which you are trying to do. Some intermediate physical vital state which you evoke by drugging the nervous system into unconsciousness and the man is thrown into some sort of intermediate, you know, physical vital levels in which all kinds of elementary beings are operating and you think that he is getting into some marvelous condition. It's not at all anything. You see, the doctors did it with anesthetics long ago. Secondly, if not drinking, the doctors did it with anesthetics with chlor chloroform and, you know, the, the ether and uh, injection and they, they put you to unconscious. To prove that there are other planes of consciousness possible to man, available to man, capable of being developed, this is not the procedure. This is one way to say that it is there, yes. Now, how to develop consciously those planes of consciousness and how to utilize for the benefit of man's fulfillment on earth? We have not even entered the, 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 the realm of spiritual life. When you are not seen, that is why Shirondo began his psychology by saying, psychological, psychology is eminently a subjective science. And in it one can proceed by knowledge of oneself to the knowledge of others. This is the sentence he has used. And that, that, that is really the basic sentence for any psycho. Then you can ask him, do you know who you are? Well, then don't claim to know that you know psychologies. You are studying a mental thesis, a mental, you are preparing what you call, the, you know, the doctorate thesis and the presenting it before uh, the world to prove that you are very intelligent. We grant you are intelligent. You are intelligent and you can put your whatever you want to argue out in a rational way. That's all. It doesn't mean it is true. <laughs> it only means you, you can put a thing logically, whatever it is. It doesn't mean what you say is right. Only what your presentation is logical and you are satisfied with it. That's all. It doesn't mean anything much. <laughs> it doesn't mean any, any, any approach to the truth unless you must know that basically psychology requires knowledge of inner self. And then that inner self and inner knowledge has been worked out for 5,000 years in a country by hundreds of persons devoting their whole life. There may be mistakes, there may be superstition, there may be miracles, there may be you know, impo imposters, there may be wrongs, but there is also a very powerful grain of truth and also a systematic approach and a scientific you know, organization of that knowledge. It is there. It is not as if you begin for the first time and you think that you are in the, you are first in the field of uh, psychology. 
this it is really you know overwhelming sense of self importance which make these people think as if nobody else probed into human psychology before them and to say that because other people did not proceed in your fashion therefore it is not scientific what is scientific something based on experiment then i say indian psychology is absolutely scientific it is based on experiment why should the condition of experiment be only experiment of physical science because all material is not physical you are dealing with psychology therefore the the systems also the methods also will be psychological and not material not physical and that's i told the the philosophical congress in india not to a private audience publicly i said that psychology cannot become a science on a par with physics and chemistry unless you find out the weight of a thought you must find out the weight of a thought or energy of an impulse the power behind an idea then you can say now we can become a physical science otherwise you cannot become wait till then it is you will see you wait till you find out that it's no use claiming that it can become a physical science well i was referring to the removal of fatigue and that is how it came it is it <laughs> Yes, without taking drug, you can remove the fatigue. That's the point. <laughs> without no drug, simply remain quiet without and quiet within. Can you say the strength is near you, all around you? When you remain quiet, it will rush into you. That's also simply open to that force from inside and outside, and you will get it. People say that uh, nature is called prakriti in Indian philosophical term. Nature. is prakriti and the part of subjectivity that watches the nature is called purusha the self or witness prakriti means nature is a force is the force that acts this force may be in action or in quiescence prakriti is not always action prakriti also may hold back just as the reservoir power of a reservoir on a hill now there a tremendous power is there but it is held back it, it is potential the pressure only is exerted but you do not feel the 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 flow of the current you see well it may be in action or in quiescence but when it rests it is as much a force as when it acts it doesn't cease to be a force because it doesn't act this is simple enough isn't it a man with a certain power need not act but that does not mean that the power has ceased to exist in him he puts it differently by saying the sea is there and the waves also are there but the waves are not the sea and when there is no wave and the sea is still well it does not stop to be the sea the same with nature nature may be active not active quiescent or or dynamic but uh, it doesn't make any difference to its existence because it does move or act or flow it doesn't mean that it is not there so nature may be there when there may be quiescence of nature or want of sign of any outer activity there is a condition there are some people at least in indian mentality i think that it is different in the in western mind but in india the idea is that when you are devoted to spiritual life then you can be careless in your outer life you need not care for regularity order or oh, yogi is is beyond you know social conventions and therefore he does not care for well uh, this was very often the mm. i think the idea which many foreigners had about indians i think some time back not now anyway they found it wrong when they had to deal with me when i was in england so one friend professor leo ross he was uh, he gave me time for lunch that certain way you know you see a restaurant at 1 o'clock so i was there about 5 or 7 minutes before 1 o'clock waiting for him and he came about 10 minutes after or 15 minutes after and uh, then he found that i was there waiting for him say yeah, i am very sorry i said very sorry i thought you wouldn't be here i said that just a mistake committed <laughs> i had to tell him that 
I said, just the mistake you committed. I have, I am in England and I have at least more than 300 appointments kept up to now without a minute's mistake because I believe in other people's sacredness of time apart from mine, <laughs> which is quite another. But uh, I mean, I don't want to waste somebody else's time. So this idea that uh, when you do yoga, it doesn't matter time and it doesn't matter regularity, order. He is drawing attention to that because the, the world that is to come down, the truth world of which we are speaking, the divine light will introduce an efficient order. He is drawing attention to that because the, the world that is to come down, the truth world of which we are speaking, the divine light will introduce an efficient order. It will not be a world in which there will be no order. He is giving, a, you know, notice in advance, almost well in advance of its descent. Efficiency and discipline are indispensable. Yes. Orderly harmony and organization in physical things is necessary part of efficiency and perfection and makes the instrument fit for whatever work is given to it. When you are disciplined and in order, then you can become a, a very efficient instrument of the divine. Because the last part of execution of the divine's idea or you know, impulse is to be carried out in material conditions, is it not? And in material physical conditions, what you require is order, discipline, harmony and, and a way of doing things. You, you can't do it, you know, pell-mell in a way in which... Uh, Disorder would be the, the the order. It can't be done. That's why he says that you instrument fit for whatever work is given to it. There can be no physical life without order and rhythm. A rhythm is a repetition of you know a, a movement in a harmony. You see, without order and rhythm, there can be no physical life. Whenever when this order is changed. It must be in obedience to an inner growth. You can change the order. Today the order is of one type. Well, after two years when you advance in yoga, the order may be of another type, but it will be an order. See, if you are service and doing serving outside, you naturally arrange your whole timetable, I mean schedule in the way, so that you may keep your time outside. Now, if you resign your job and do something else, naturally you change your schedule again. But it's a schedule. You understand? It is not that you are bound to one mechanical routine. No. But you are free to adopt necessary order and rhythm of organization in life. When the order is changed, it must be in obedience to inner growth and not for the sake of external novelty. There are people who change things because some new thing is found out and so we must be up to date and give an impression to society that we are people who are always with the latest fashion, so to say, with the latest gadgets that are produced. <laughs> well, not for the sake of novelty. In the most physical things, you have to fix a program in order to deal with them. Otherwise, all becomes a sea of confusion and half as are. And there is the one thing which Apart from anybody else, the mother would never tolerate <laughs> one thing. There must be an order and a way of doing who, what will done, second, third, fourth, fifth, everything, yes. And it must go like that. Wanton waste, careless spoiling of physical things. In an incredibly short time, and I've seen many Americans doing it, I must tell you. Loose disorder, misuse of service of anything, of materials, due either to vital grasping or to tamasic inertia, are baneful to prosperity and tend to drive away or discourage the wealth power. Mahalakshmi. Before even the thing is, is completely over, I have seen people spinning over their whole bottles. Not using even, you know, more than a one third or something like that. I always say, but this has cost money. Always, I I don't know how automatically it happens to my mind. Uh, why does it throw it away? 
something which is not even half used. It's simple, throw away. And throw in a systematic manner, you throw away at one place so that it gathers. And then when it is gathered, you, 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 you throw it somewhere where it can be again, you know, taken up into use. It is absolutely one of the professors, I think it was at Stanford University, an old man of 82. He told me, Mr. Purani, we waste food. You have no idea of what food we waste. This is exactly he told me in Stanford University. And I think it is not wrong. What we waste, you have no idea, he told me. Because one student brought, you see, there is a service done by students in Stanford University. Those people who serve there are students, you see. And uh, uh, the, when we were passing through their, you know, the dining room, he, he saw them, you know, throwing <laughs> things about. <laughs> And he told me, you have no idea of how much waste <laughs> these people they are doing as, as, a, as a people. He was telling about himself, not particularly about himself, but about the habit that is getting into the younger generation. That, and this fellow, I told first time I told him like that, that you are having a car and you don't know how to take care of it. Then why do you have a car? If you don't know how to take care of it, don't keep <laughs> If you keep, keep it in order. And one instance I can never forget. I bought for the mother a refrigerator, Frigidaire, in 1927 with the help of a friend of mine. There was no refrigerator in the arsenal. 1927. I got money from my friend and, well, got it. After 30 years, you go and look at it. You can put it in a showcase and sell it today brand new. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nobody will believe it it is used for 27 years. Well, that's there is a this uh, generator generator that creates electricity installed in 1954. You go there and now if you take it out and put it anybody will buy it as new. Anybody will buy it as new. The way they take care of it, because it is done with an attitude of service to the divine, and order and efficiency, therefore, the oiling, the vibration, the starting, the stopping, everything done like that. And years and years it goes on giving service, because matter also is conscious. It is wrong to think that these have nothing in them. They have a consciousness of their own, and they respond to the human attitude and behavior. I have seen, for instance, with animals it is very well known to people. A horse, for instance, knows the condition of the, of the rider. I mean, if you are on an errand which is urgent, he feels your urgency. He feels your urgency, absolutely. Well, perhaps the car also does that if you know how to deal with it. <laughs> Driving the, the, the wealth power, these things have long been rampant in society and if it continues, an increase in our means might well mean proportionate increase in wastage, increase in disorder and neutralize the material advantage and advance. Because there is more is produced, you should not waste. Now, it is a very, very great truth to be learned. This is the power of Mahasaraswati, the divine power that dictates perfection in material things. This is the province of the higher power on the plane of matter, higher power on the plane of life, higher power on the plane of will, higher power on the plane of knowledge. Four aspects of the supreme power power of knowledge, power of will, power of plenty or material prosperity, and power of perfection in physical and material things. This is the perfection in physical and material things. There is a consciousness in each physical thing. Yes, he is coming to that. Okay. With which one can communicate. Everything has an individuality of a certain kind. Houses, cars, Furniture, see? 
etc. The ancient people knew that and so they saw a spirit or a genius in every physical thing. And there was some truth in that. People have idea that consciousness exists only when there is you know, apparent life. But consciousness is not bound to this sort of outer organization of life, you see. Instruments have their own, you know, consciousness, if you call it being or, or a decision or will and likes and dislikes. A carpenter's, you know, chisel, well, if he has made it his own, it won't like to be used by another man. And if he dies, he will get hurt. Nine out of ten, he will get a cut. <laughs> Uh, because the, the thing is, there is a, you know, adjustment between one who uses and the thing that he uses. And if, if the vibration is a common, it's all right. But if there is something else, the operation doesn't go. Engine can, can, can feel your impact. Can feel your impact if you... Machinery being granted. If machinery is at fault, then there is nothing because then it's like a hand cut off, you see, or uh, then the man is not living. You see, if man's lungs is stopped and you say now he does not respond, but because the lung is stopped. So if all the machine mechanical parts are all right and if the machine has stopped, well, it will immediately feel your impact and start if you have will, goodwill for it, it will start. It stops because some unconscious force also comes and stops it. Very often accidents are due to that. Accidents are not, uh, you know, happenings that happen without operation of forces that act. They, they happen because some forces act. And they bring about the changes in the conditions of things and, and precipitate a crisis, so to say, which brings about an accident. Accident is maneuvered from the vital plane. Accident doesn't take place simply because it is an accident. No, there is behind it a preparation. A preparation is being done and suddenly precipitation on the physical level is so quick and immediate that uh, prevention is very difficult unless you, you can act in time or you get the intuition or in, in, in instinct in time to, to react and to counteract the, the forces that have decided to bring about the accident, you see. These are vital forces of, uh, you know, that are interested in human world and want always to, to try to govern some corner of human life. And they succeed because human being gives them a chance of intervention. And uh, it is willed processes. These are, <coughs> accidents are not half as are happening, but they are, prepared in the vital world before they actually take place in the plane of physical life. <clears throat> there is a consciousness in physical things, a life which is not the life and consciousness of man or animal, which we know, but still secret and real. That is why we must have respect for physical things and use them rightly, not misuse them and waste, ill-treat them or handle with carelessness roughness. This feeling of all being conscious and alive comes when our physical consciousness, not our mind only, but physical consciousness, awakens out of its obscurity and becomes aware of the one in all. Then you find that what supports you in the physical is the support of the one in all. Well, then, then your respect for things around you becomes enhanced and then you deal with them uh, as if they were, they were, you know, important items in your scheme of things, because they fulfill a conscious function. So it's not that it is something unconscious that is around you. What you write about singing, one sadhak was a musician, and so he said, what you write about singing is perfectly correct. That you sing your best only when you forget yourself. And let it come out from within without thinking of need of excellence or the impression that it may make. The outer singer should indeed disappear into the past. It is only so that the inner singer can take place. If singing to an audience pulls you out of inner condition, 
then you could postpone that and sing for yourself and the divine. He doesn't say stop singing. Sing for yourself and the divine. Until you are able, even in facing an audience, to forget the audience. If you are troubled by failure or excited by success, that also you must overcome. Either you must not be over enthusiastic when you succeed or depressed because people don't appreciate. There are always, there are some people in the ashram, there are 1400 people and then sometimes there are two natures that don't agree, which is not the only place where it, this happens, I think all over the world. <laughs> the problem is man, is it not? So, when you have a collectivity, four people, three people, a family or a group or a society or a shop or a hospital or a workshop or an organization, the problem is not organization, the problem is man. <laughs> Trouble is, oh, there is somebody who is not doing what he should do and then somebody says, he doesn't carry out what I say and the third man says, he has wrong idea and the fourth man says, he is irregular and fifth man says, well, this man I don't like, this won't go unless he goes and so. That, that's how it happens, is it not? <laughs> <laughs> that is collective life, beginning with a small family unit, to a shop, to a workshop, to hospital, to organization, anywhere. Well, that is what is. There are always defects on both sides which lead to disharmony. So, he makes it very clear not to be self-complacent and think that one is always right. It's very important. <laughs> Conclusion which you can draw from it is that never to be under the illusion that one is always right. There are always two, he said. He doesn't say, he, he puts it very cleverly. <laughs> there are always defects on both sides which lead to disharmony. Each human being is composed of different personalities that feel and behave in a different way. And his action is determined by the one that happens to be prominent at the time. So it is not as it were the whole man has behaved in a particular way. One personality of him has behaved in a particular way. But each is composed of many persons. So one fellow has come to the front and done something which was perhaps not correct or right or harmonious. But uh, the other fellows who are inside had nothing to do and you can't hold them responsible for what that one fellow did. <laughs> and that is the difficulty with, with uh, group life or with uh, combined action, that um, to take the sum total of positive, you know, attribute or positive qualities of the individuals and to put the negative sum on one side as if it is an element to be eliminated gradually. You see, the difficulty is that if you want to open your consciousness only to perfection, then you must open it only to God, because God alone is perfect. All human beings will be imperfect, is it not? So, <laughs> then if, if interchange or meeting or communication is necessary or compulsory or needful for growth, then one must be prepared for understanding that we have to take positive element and treat that as a capital to increase gradually. Whatever is negative is there on all sides. And that is a thing to be eliminated. How to get it out? It is not how to disqualify somebody, but how to get the maximum benefit of his positive qualities to the work. And how to make him capable of eliminating his own defects. That is the problem. Problem is not to get only good people, because it is very difficult to get only good people. <laughs> because when good people come together, then they find out that everything is not as good as it is. <laughs> 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 Things are not as good as they thought or believed or wanted to be. The main difficulty for many is to be sure of the right answer. There is a reference in the inner life to get the right guidance. That's what we were talking this afternoon at six o'clock. Main difficulty for many is to be sure of the right answer. For that it is necessary to be able to contact the inner consciousness of the Guru inwardly. And that comes by devotion to the 
guru or the divine. If you contact the guide, or as I said, eliminate by by taking up a temporary decision and keeping your mind open to another suggestion or guidance, one gets the correct guidance afterwards. If there is straight away a contact with the Supreme or with the Guru by pure devotion, one gets the guidance at once. Correct answer. Otherwise, one has to eliminate by temporarily accepting the answer that comes as a decision taken up for the time being and keeping a mind or consciousness open for a further guidance or a correction in the answer if that is not the final reply or final decision to be executed in life. That is generally the procedure, the two procedures. Somebody asked whether the infinite Satchidananda could be realized in life. Certainly, the highest realization Satchidananda is realizable in works. And then he says, good Lord, how could the integral yoga exist if it was not? <laughs> and I think we'll stop there. Tonight, tomorrow, we'll take up another subject. I can say by increasing it. <laughs> you see, by becoming less selfish, by thinking less of what you get or what you must have, there are two kinds of devotion in, in traditional yoga which are really genuine. One is with motive and one is without motive. In the devotion with motive, you have some motive. Say for instance, a, a boat is drowning in the sea. Then one immediately feels the, the impulse for devotion for God. And his purpose is to be saved from being drowned or the, the boat is sinking and he wishes for divine help. That's one. Or you want to attain a purpose. And then you devote yourself to the divine or address devotion to God in order that that object which you have in view may be fulfilled. Or you want to know something. How is the world or how is it managed or uh, how am I constituted? Uh, what is good for me or true for me? Then you, by act of devotion, appeal to the divine to give you the knowledge. So Gita enumerates three types of devotees. Artha means one who is under stress of difficulty. Jignasu is one who wants to know the truth, either about himself or about nature or about something or about God or anything. One who wants to know the truth, seeker. And, uh, well, one who has some purpose in view means utility. There is a case going on in court and you say that I must win the case. Well, in that case you appeal and go to the devote, and go with devotion to God and pray that this should win. I must win. Uh, God must be on your side. That is one. Fourth type of bhakti is the knower, one who has the knowledge who knows himself and knows also the ultimate truth. And because he knows that the ultimate truth is supreme, eternal and infinite, he devotes himself to it with full understanding of identity. That is the highest type of bhakti from Gita's point of view. Pure bhakti yoga will say, no, there are two types of devotion. One is with motive and another is without motive. In devotion, when you say, Really speaking, it is love. When Narada described and defined bhakti in his bhakti sutra, there are small aphorisms of bhakti by Narada, ascribed to Narada. I don't think Narada wrote them, but somebody wrote in Narada's name. Anyway, it is a scientific exposition of the path of bhakti practice in India by many people for several hundred years. There are two. One is Parashar and another is Narada. Now, Parashar bhakti sutra and Narada bhakti sutra, two lines of bhakti, you see, uh, exposition of bhakti. And there the definition is sa kasmai parama prema swarupa. Bhakti means, devotion means supreme love for somebody or someone. That is devotion. And to distinguish it from ordinary love, they gave it the name bhakti, devotion, you see. But it is love. Then they will say in Vaishnava literature 
that love for the divine means devotion is of two types. One is self-regarding and another is, well, motiveless, without any motive. Ahaituki, haituki bhakti. Ahaituki means without any motive. Haituki means with motive. So with motive, then the ideal devotee in the Vaishnava cult is Radha. Because she has no, nothing to ask from Krishna, they will say. She is only thinking of Krishna. That's all. And how to make him happy. What Krishna does with her is not her concern. If Krishna does not meet her, uh, she is not at all disturbed. If Krishna is absent, she does not say, oh, he must be here. Because her devotion to Krishna is motiveless. Only thinking of Krishna and not of what happens to her. That is the acme of devotion, you see. Motiveless love for the divine. So that to feel that the divine is is the only thing to be loved, that's all. And, uh, well, the act of loving is its own return. Act of loving, not, not afterwards what comes as a reaction to it. That itself is the return of it. And that is why they will ask, any, any great bhakti in India will ask, let me have the devotion of Radha, so that I ask nothing from God except devotion to Him, that's all. The highest reward that a devotee asks is devotion. Not divine presence, not delight, not contact, not presence, no. This is really uh, highest bhaktas in India always aspire to that. There are very few. I don't say that everybody who claims to be Vaishnava is a bhakta of that type. But uh, that is their ideal. The ideal is not to ask anything from the divine except devotion. And that you can do by graduation. It is also graduated bhakti. They will give you steps one by one. You see, remembering, then they will say, um, you know, purification, then uh, devoting yourself by service to the divine, making service to the divine, so that what you do is an offering of your service as a person to another person. So they will have a photo or image or inner, inner image in which he will put a light to it or he will worship it or make it take bath or give a garland to it and so on. Uh, they do it either externally or internally according to the to the stage of devotion, you see. And all the time you are occupied with offering your loving devotion to the Supreme. You see, that is how it can increase gradually. And they will say you must always be in good company. Satsanga sarvathai vatyaj. Dusanga sarvathai vatyaj. You must not be in an atmosphere which is anti-divine or contrary to the divine, or atheistical. They give you rules like that, one by one. I am giving you because I, I have seen this, I have known this also, and I went through this partly and so on. Now that's a good path in a way, in its own way. It, was, it is good, but uh, it has its own barrier. And I, divine is not only love, that's why. You see, but there's another matter. This is the path of, this is the path of devotion, how it works. Path, if it is sincerely followed and truly carried out, but to carry out, to become Radha is the acme of unselfishness. You can't imagine. It's surrender means, whenever you think of surrender, mother will say, Radha surrender. Mother has written a Radha's prayer. Have you seen? Oh, it is wonderful. Mother herself has written Radha's prayer. Because that gives you the true surrender. It is, it is marvelous. I don't know whether it is here. If I have that, I will... But I don't think I brought that with me. Yes. Yes. Radha's prayer. It's a, it is what mother wrote in 1930s, I think. You see, between 25 and 30, or between 30, 25 and 35, mother wrote that prayer. It is a very fine prayer, one of the most inspired prayers. And that puts the, 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 the whole central you know, truth of bhakti yoga at its highest. That is devotion of yoga. But everybody doesn't have um, a devotional nature and as a dominant note. No, one has to develop it. No, one can develop it. 
The Vaishnavas always say that it is like a seed that has to grow. In the literature they speak of it, that bhakti means love, and love begins, uh, you know, or the popular they say, what is it, a packet of pins, is it not? No? They say in, in a popular language, do they not say like that? I'll give a packet of pins, that's the way the love begins. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't get at it, no? <laughs> they said that the, the, the seed of bhakti begins with very small attraction, attachment, curiosity, knowing what is the divine. Then ultimately you will want to know something about him. Then all the time you will want to know about him only and nothing else. That is exactly how it it takes place in bhakti yoga of the classical type, traditional. It is a path and it's a very good path in one sense, only life becomes channelized. You have to devote hours, you see. Then they will set up a temple in the house and, you see, worship and garland and remembering the name and all the time wanting him and then Several times, there is a lot of work. <laughs> it's a process which to me appeared as if it was uh, not in answer to modern times. I mean, you see, and the divine has to satisfy humanity, and then humanity has vast field in which uh, the play of the Supreme must, must uh, make it possible for all to participate, and not a small group. And uh, there, that absolute devotion and surrender can come. That's why Shirando took surrender. You understand? Shirando has not neglected the central force of all the yogas. There is no yoga that can claim that uh, certain part of its fundamental is left out in Shirando's yoga. That is the great service which he has rendered to the whole of humanity. That all the elements that were indispensable to the growth of man, to the highest spiritual attainment, have been there. Surrender is from Bhakti Yoga. But then surrender is not merely emotional, but also in the will, also in the mind. You understand? Whereas in the bhakti yoga of old traditional time, the surrender is mainly emotional and intellect is neglected. So is karma. Will. Karma is restricted only to worship, acts of devotion to the divine. You see, here the field of karma is widened out. And worship also is widened out because you worship the divine everywhere. So that it becomes more global in one sense. But that has its own results, I know. It has its own efficacy and its own relevancy to people who are called to it. And collectivity also, bhakti, you see. That is, where people who are devoted to the divine come, come together and either meditate or do, you know, the kirtan or singing the songs of devotion to him and so on, or worship in collectivity. And that is also one method of doing it. There are ways. Satsang, you meet in good company always and avoid, you know, people who, who have a counter vibration. And many such things have to be carried out in life. And here you enter in the integral, you enter in the fight. You can't avoid it. <laughs> you, you don't invite it, but uh, if it comes, it comes. And you say, all right, <laughs> you have to meet it. Devotion with motive one can develop into motiveless devotion, and they will give the instance of Dhruva. You know the story of Dhruva, the prince? He was five years old, and uh, he had a stepmother. His father was a king, you see, and uh, he had uh, a stepmother, this Dhruva, and so one day he went over when his father was sitting on the throne, and he went over to his father, and uh, the father wanted to take him up. When his stepmother, the stepwife, you see, the second wife came and said that, why do you allow? He is the son of my, you know, what you call the co-wife, and uh, I, uh, you, you should not take him, you must take my son. She had a child, and she said, you see. So he, the father could not decide, and the boy felt very much insulted. So he went back to his mother and said that, you see, he was going to sit and the other mother came and told him that he couldn't sit because um, uh, she is not my mother and so on. So she said, that is true, that she is favorite, she said. And uh, therefore, he, he may not give you the throne. 
In one to five years, she must have talked something very simple and childish to her. So he said that, and I will go to God and, and pray to him that I must get the throne. I am the eldest child, I must get the throne. He said, all right, I can't do it. You, how can you go to the uh, forest and do tapasya or go to God? It's not difficult, you are a child. So at night he ran away from his house. <laughs> he ran away from his house. And then Narad Rishi happened to meet him and told him, what do you want? He said that I want God. So he said, all right, sit down here and, and, and worship God and offer yourself to God. He will come to you. So Narad went to heaven, they will say in Indian mythology, had to and told him that that young boy is there and he wants you. He said that I want God. So after some time, in several years, God came to him and told him, what do you want? Then he remembered, he said, yes, it is true that I began uh, devotion for you because I wanted the throne. But now I don't want the throne. I wish that I should always remember you and nothing else. That's all that I want. And that became the pole. You know, pole star? Mm -hmm. Its name is Dhruva in India. The name of the child was Dhruva. And Dhruva is something fixed you know, unchanging and immutable like that. So he became Dhruva. That is the sign, that is the story. Well, <laughs> so from motive of devotion, it became motiveless devotion, you see. It is possible for development to uh, move from stage to stage. And there are nine kinds of bhakti. I didn't tell you all the details. <laughs> <laughs> See, bhakti is of the servant and the master, of a friend to a friend, of, uh, you know, of lovers, of father and child, of mother and child, navada bhakti, nine types of bhakti. That is the classical way. And so one practices any type of emotional being that comes into him, you see. So you practice the, the master and servant, then you become like a faithful servant all the time, 24 hours serving the divine. There are people who do that in India. Very few now, but they do. Like that. From morning to night, it is service. Getting up at six, taking bath early, bathing the image and making it dress and giving it morning lunch and morning tiffin and then this and, and then, you know, dressing it and feeding it at 12 lunch. And then going again, doing everything, cleaning the whole. All day is only service. Is a master. And they will say, oh, yes. If you tell him, uh, what is it? No, master is sleeping, he will say. The master is sleeping. Now I must go. Why? Oh, it's not time for master's lunch. That's how they actually have the, the real feeling. I mean, they are not making fake at all. They, they are genuine about it. Will they get some progress in return? No, it's not bad. Not one part of yoga in bhakti was so not one thread of bhakti. You see, there are several strands. May not do, motivated and without motive. But in that, there are kinds and colors of bhakti, you see. Right now, you do not mean to say that right now you can command the divine. You understand? <laughs> That's it. Right now you can do. Myself. Yes, right now you can do. That's right every second you can do. Now, the only thing is that that should not have any compulsive force on the divine. You see, because to him he must give free. Yeah, that, yeah. And I'm interested. Yeah, in that's it. That's it. No, generally people are not so impersonal as you think they are. <laughs> they say I to give you the instance of my lady friend who told me six years I am doing so much work and concentrating, and now I am thinking of giving it up because nothing happens, and I think that it's a failure. And this. so I listened to it for two days, three days. Then as she was sincere and good, and I also didn't want to be only social with her and correct. So I said, look here, it seems then that divine doesn't know what you are doing. Not only that, you know what you are doing. And you are the best judge of what you are doing. And you think that you are completely qualified and completely true and right. And divine is unjust and not right in and giving you the return that you deserve. And therefore... Not only divine is ignorant, but divine is unjust. No, 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 I said. But that is what your logic comes to. What your logic comes to is that. In this task of self-development, 
The one who aspires never sits on judgment on his efforts. Because one never completely knows himself. It is nobody's fault. One never completely knows oneself. So what little part one knows is not capable of making a final judgment about what one is doing. Therefore, what we do is that we axiomatically start with this attitude that other side is correct. The other side. This side well, is to set itself right. To say that this is set right, something is to be set right there is, is just the wrong procedure. You see, just the wrong way of doing things. And a friend of mine came and remained eight months in Pondicherry, quite an old man at that time, my age perhaps, or a little older. And uh, he told me, but you see that uh, but mother sees so and so, but Shirundo replied to so and so, I wrote a letter, he one month, two months, I, you see, I tried practice samatha, patience, all kinds of things. So I said, all right. After two, three months, I told him, look here, now you are a friend and you have come here spending time and energy on this. So let me tell you what I think, because otherwise you will go on bothering yourself and me also. <laughs> <laughs> now I can tell you one thing. Don't try to find out why that happens. That you'll never know with this mind. So, you try to set yourself here, this side right. Other side will take care of itself. You set right here, this side. This is the staircase. Mother sees people on the staircase. You know that staircase. So, I said, don't try to think about the staircase. You take for granted that is correct. Now, this side is to be set right and corrected. Well, then it is easy because even if you commit a mistake or they commit a mistake, you don't lose anything. You gain all the time because your concentration is on yourself. People, when they sit like that and think, the other side, the divine has to, he doesn't do, I am all right, I am all right. That is exactly what is wrong. One is not all right. <laughs> And then thinks he's all right. What is to be done? Mm -hmm. So with the incomplete knowledge of self, the best is not to make any final judgment and say, we have to make an effort. And it is only when it succeeds that the conditions are fulfilled. You are right when the thing happens. Then you say, that was right. Till then, the other side is not wrong. This side is not right. That's all. <laughs> You see, till then, the account is to be set right on this side of the, of the sum. If 5 plus 5 multiplied by 4 is equal to 20, 20 is right. Now, if 5 is trying all the time and 20 is not there, then you know that the, the right multiplication is not there. Some, as soon as 4 comes, you will say, oh, it's 20. That's quite right. Both sides, correct. So the effort, when this side we are making an effort and it doesn't seem to bear fruit, we say something is wrong in the effort or something imperfection or something is lacking. Let us try to be sincere, serious, patient, you know, detached and um, do as much as our aspiration can do, concentrate and make all sincere effort and see. And when, when it gets done, then you know, ah, now the conditions are fulfilled. That's the way to look at it. Otherwise, if one gets impatient or calculates the quantity or the, the effort that one is making, then there is a mistake in the account because it is always under the view of subjectivity and that subjective view of one's own effort is always colored, always. Nobody can be very impersonal with himself unless he has done a good amount of yoga and a good guru has met him to make him feel all the time that he is a fool. You see? <laughs> <laughs> and that good fortune came to us. <laughs> that was the greatest good fortune. <laughs> he never allowed us any idea of going out that we were all right. <laughs> Not he. <laughs> he said that you are nincompoos, oh, you are useless fellows, no? He always said you have great powers. <laughs> but it's not yet out yet. <laughs> Say like that. So it was good.
very good his first act will be to make us know ourselves and he begins by telling us that we don't know ourselves you see and he begins by giving us the knowledge of how imperfect we are with regard to the knowledge of our own that we don't know the whole of ourselves that's why there is a deficiency in our act. the natural condition of all there is not a special disqualification of any individual the general condition of all people, you see, 